Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm pastor and teacher Curtis Omo, and today we continue our study in the book of Psalms, and we'll be studying Psalm 74. Now, before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins. At the same time, we want to allow the Holy Spirit to control us, and we do that by giving ourselves over to Him. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have provided so we can study your word. We ask now that our hearts and minds be open and ready to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to show you the introduction page, but just sum it up for you. Okay, you can read it if you want, but I'm going to take out the main things that we need to hear and just say them. Psalm 74 is a national lament. The entire country, what's left of Israel at this point, is lamenting over their situation. <clears throat> in 586 BC, we have one of the most famous events in the history of Israel. The captivity of those who lived in Judah. Now this is all that's left of the nation Israel at this time. And they're taken into captivity, and many of them go over to Babylon. Babylon is the enemy who uh, destroys the temple, kills many of the people, uh, destroys the walls of the cities, and so on. In other words, there's a great deal of devastation. And they are under the, uh, we might say, captivity, or sometimes they call it the exile. They're exiled out of the land, all right, for right now. And they are lamenting to God. They're crying out to God for some relief, which really sounds quite natural, doesn't it? So what happens is you have a psalmist here who wrote about this, and he represents the people in his crying out to God. Now here's the message. The psalmist calls for God to remember his people during this catastrophic event. He laments the destruction of the temple and the victory of the enemy, and prays that the God who destroyed the enemy in the past, so he's looking back to history, will not permit this taunt, this, this making fun of, this scoffing and reproach to continue. The outline, one, the psalmist calls out to God that he not forget his people and Zion. If you remember, Zion is the uh, mountain upon which the temple was built, Jerusalem was built. And the psalmist wants the Lord to act towards them. That's what it means when it says take steps towards them. Two, the psalmist laments the destruction that has desolated the sanctuary. That would be the temple, same thing. And put the nation in jeopardy. Three, the psalmist pleads to God for help, reminding him of his powerful, creative work over nature and chaos. We'll talk about that. Four, the psalmist pleads to God to consider his covenant so these adversaries will stop reviling him and oppressing his people so they can have reason to praise. So basically what they're doing is uh, they're calling out to God for some relief from their enemies. And in doing so, they recall some of the things that God has got done for them in the past. Okay? That's really a pretty simple psalm. And it's very good because it has a lot to say to us about lamenting on a level of, of a, a nation. How the people of the, a nation might want to call to God when they're in great need, like in wartime or something like that. Well, let's begin the superscription. A maskil of Asaph. Now we see this word maskil now and then. We actually don't know for sure what it means, but it appears to mean something like something very skillfully written or well written. So it's a well written psalm. And I just leave it as maskil. That way you kind of have an idea of an old definition of what it means. Now Asaph, if you if you studied Psalm seventy four. He was a Levite, one of the tribes, the priestly tribe. He 
He was involved in the choir, as was his family after him. Like I said, we studied that back in Psalm 73. So that's who Asaph is. He's basically uh, a major uh, choir member, or you might say uh, a chorus leader, a choir leader, something like that. So now we begin our first section, which we just went over in the outline. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the board so you can just read it with me. This is the first section, verses 1 through 3. The psalmist calls out to God that he not forget his people and Zion and take steps towards them. Verse 1. God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Now, notice how they open up when they say, why have you rejected us forever? It's as if God is never going to come back and get them. It's so bad. They've lost sight of the fact that they're still God's people, but we're going to see later on, later on that they're not. They haven't really lost track of that. It says that things seem so bad. You know, sometimes we'll use exaggerated terms to make our point. It could be what they're doing here. God, it's so bad right now. Are you ever coming back? You know, something like that. So that's the idea. In other words, when you're upset, <clears throat> when you're pleading, when you're asking for help, you might tell everything to God the way you feel. God, I don't feel like I'm ever going to recover. God, I don't feel like I'm ever going to get out of this. Well, they go on. Second line. Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Now, smoke is just the result of what? Fire. So it's like God is angry, and it's like he's smoking. He's so angry at us. That's the idea, burning anger. So they're asking, God, how can you be this angry at us, that you'd have us destroyed, you'd have us over in a foreign land? Yes, we were obedient. We were disobedient. We weren't doing what we're supposed to do, but, man, you really took it out on us. So the punishment they're getting is just incredible. So they appeal to God. And they ask him for uh, some help. That's basically what this amounts to. Verse 2, they recall to God, remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old. Let me spread this out just a little bit. Okay. Which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage, and this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. So they continue. They tell God to remember. God, remember us in the past. Remember everything you've done for us. Uh, he says congregation here. That's basically the assembly. Remember when we were in assembly worship? Okay. Then he says, which you have purchased, or that can mean just or acquired, of old. A long time ago, God redeemed the nation of Israel. If you remember the story of Abraham, uh, how he got the covenant, started the nation with Abraham, excuse me, started the people with Abraham, then started the nation with Moses. So they're well past that now. So they are reminding God that you bought us a long time ago. We're still yours. Um, they call uh, God the Redeemer here. They use the word redeem, which you have redeemed. Remember the Redeemer was the one who took over the main role in the family if someone was to die, like the father or the husband. He would step in and help who was left. So they're calling the Lord the Redeemer. You're our leader. That's kind of another way to put it. And he says, to be the tribe of your heritage. Well, there's only really one tribe left, and that's Judah. So maybe that's what that's referring to. But anyway, it's, it's the people of Israel that's left, just a southern kingdom now. And then he mentions, and this Mount Zion, remember Mount Zion was the mountain upon which Jerusalem and the temple were built. They were way up in the air. Uh, if you've ever seen some good maps, let me just show you a little picture of this here. So you have this sort of mountain going up, okay? And you have Mount Zion up here. This is Mount Zion. Okay? So... Here would be the city of Jerusalem. It would be down here. Okay, so up here was the temple. Well, uh, the temple's been destroyed now, okay, but it was up here, right, upon the Temple Mount. And it's just rubble now. It's just rubble. 
Okay, so that's Mount Zion. Verse 3. Here, let me adjust that a little bit here. Okay, verse 3. Step toward the permanent ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. So basically they're asking the Lord to step down, start to act towards this place that's just been destroyed, the one the enemy has destroyed, and they destroyed everything in the sanctuary, everything in the temple. So this is the ruins right here of what's left of the temple. Okay, just the ruins. That's basically all that's left. Verse 4. Let's go ahead and move this down. Just get it out of the way. Your enemies roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their battle flag. So now they're saying they went right into where you used to meet with your people here in the temple. Okay, still back here on the ruins. They set up their banners, their battle flags. Those are the signs that they've had victory. They're the signs that um, what's left of Israel is no longer a nation. And notice it uses the word, uh, well, we saw this in verse 3, actually. Let's go back to that for a moment. Notice, step toward the permanent ruins. They see it as permanent. It's over with. Lord, are you going to do anything about us now? So he, they describe it. Your enemies roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their battle flags. Battle flags, those are signs to let people know who won, where Israel is now. And remember, this is the place that they met with the Lord. Let me show you some scripture on that for a moment. Okay, let's get this out of the way for right now. I'll show you some scripture. Just listen to this scripture from 1 Kings 6.11 through 14. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon saying, as for this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will fulfill my word with you which I spoke to David your father. Now here's the main part. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will not abandon my people Israel. Notice that, and I will dwell among, this is where the Lord dwelt. It symbolized his presence. Remember the holy place and the holy of holies? And there in the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant, and that's where the Lord was to, to dwell, and no one was supposed to enter except the high priest once a year with an offering. Verse 14, so Solomon built the house and finished it. So this goes back before this temple was ruined, obviously, it's when it was first built. Okay? So that's the situation. They've described to the Lord how bad it is. This was your meeting place. The enemy have, have taken it over. Basically, there's nothing left. That's a good reason to lament. Imagine if every place you ever gathered with God's people to study the Word or worship and study uh, and pray and uh, share your offerings and, and fellowship with others it was all destroyed throughout the land. Because basically that's what's happened. The Babylonians have went throughout the land and destroyed every place they would ever meet. They destroyed their buildings, their walls. Basically, they ruined everything. Nothing left. but let's go ahead and pick up the section that we're in right now by looking at our Roman numeral two. The psalmist laments the destruction that has desolated the sanctuary and put the nation in jeopardy. Jeopardy means that, me, that means that they could just fall apart anytime completely. So, again, let's read verse four. Your enemies roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their battle flags. We saw that up on Mount Zion in my little sketch a moment ago. When it talks about them roaring, that's like lions. They're like a bunch of lions up there. Okay? 
They're so loud and you can hear them. Go on. Verses 5 through 7 give some detail of this destruction. They are like one swinging axes in a forest of trees. This is really a pretty short verse, isn't it? Well, think of it for a moment. Someone out in the forest, let's say he's a big old husky person. He's got a big old axe. He's just swinging around. He's just chopping one tree after another. Sounds like old Paul Bunyan or something like that, if you know who that is. But anyway, he's out there. And this is what they're like. They're going through the sanctuary. They're going through the cities and just tearing everything down. They destroy everything. And remember, if you recall, if you've ever studied the, the temple, there was a lot of wood in that. So they destroyed all that marvelous woodwork. See, one of the things they'd be doing is getting the gold off of it and taking it back to Babylon. So they are, they are very destructive. Verse 6, And now they tear down all its carved woodwork with axe and hammers. So here's what's really going on. They're inside just tearing everything apart. The word for hammer here, it's, a, it's only used once in the Hebrew. It's interesting because we don't know exactly what it is, but it seems to be something like a crowbar. In other words, they're prying off the gold off, that, off the uh, wood. Remember how there was wood overlaid with gold? So they in, destroyed all the engraved, carefully engraved woodwork by those, skills, those skilled artisans, those craftsmen. Okay? There's some scriptures on that too. I, I can give you some if you want to look them up. But here's uh, First, uh, First Kings 6, 9 through 22. And uh, 2 Kings 25, 13. Let's read that one. I'm going to bring that one. We're going to read the one in 2 Kings 25, 13. This to tells you what some of these people from Babylon did to the temple furniture and stuff like that. And the pillars of bronze that were in the house of the Lord and the stands and the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans, that's the same as the Babylonians, broke in pieces and carried the bronze to Babylon. Chaldeans, an older name for the Babylonians, okay? It's the uh, old, old Babylonians. And they took away the pots and the shovels and the snuffers and the dishes for incense and all the vessels of bronze used in the temple service. The fire pans also and the bowls. What was of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold, and what was of silver, as silver. As for the two pillars, the one sea and the stands that Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze, all these vessels were beyond weight. That just says how heavy these bronze things were, and, and bronze was valuable too. They used that for all kinds of things because it's easy to shape. So that just gives some description of what happened, how they destroyed things. Verse 7, they set on fire your sanctuary, that's the temple again, burning it to the ground. They profane the dwelling place of your name. So they're putting it in two different ways. They not only burned it down, they not only burned your temple, your sanctuary down, but they profaned it. They defiled it. They did, they, they did things with it they weren't supposed to do. Now, we know they're not supposed to burn it, but they would go in there. They don't care about being clean. They don't care about any ritual. So that's the idea here. This was a holy place. The Babylonians didn't care. And it says, the dwelling place of your name, that's where God dwelt with his people. We've said this before. Verse 8 tells us what they were thinking. They said in their heart, let's completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. So the psalmist goes on to say, they said in their hearts, that is, they thought to themselves, they're completely put all the people of Israel, what's left of them in Judah, under their submission. They're going to make them slaves. He goes on to say they have burned all their meeting places of God. That's the ones I mentioned earlier. Go out through, go throughout the land and anywhere God's people met with a with a priest. 
with a Levite where they gathered to study the scripture, uh, they would burn that place. It might be under a uh, some sort of makeshift shelter where they would get out of the sun and, and, and gather there, and they would destroy that too. So they want to completely subdue them. That means oppress them, put them down so they can't do anything. So let's understand this. Now, this is important to understand. When a nation is under God's discipline, like Israel was under this time, remember, they were his people. Every place of worship, of meeting, the main place of the temple, all the other places throughout Judah were destroyed. The Babylonians left no place to officially worship God. So there was no more regular spiritual activity. In other words, you didn't have the routine worship go on anymore. Verse 9, we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there anyone among us who knows how long this will last. Well, this news just keeps getting worse. There's no signs that God is even present anymore. That's what that means. There's no longer any prophet. The prophets aren't even functioning normal. They're out of the picture. If you know the story, the only prophet left in the land, and I don't think he's left uh, very long, is Jeremiah, and he ends up going off to Egypt. The other prophets, like Ezekiel, uh, went over to Babylon. And we know Daniel was there, but he's still pretty young yet. I don't think he's, he doesn't start prophesying until he's over there for a while. Okay. So they go on to say at the last two lines, nor is there anyone among us who knows how long this will last. We don't know how long this is going to go on and on and on. If you know the story of Daniel, later on he talks about him understanding that this time in Babylon was almost over during his lifetime, because it's seven year, 70 years, so he's an old man now. Come to section 3 now, verse 10 through 17. Let's read that. The psalmist pleads to God for help, reminding him of his powerful creative work over nature and chaos. Now, here's what the psalmist does now. He goes back and he talks to God. He says, God, I remember when you used to do great things. I remember when you, uh, you tell us in your word that you were the creator. Okay, for example, we remember you delivering your people across the sea through the plagues from Egypt and many battles. So the psalmist starts recalling these things. So when he starts to say things like, how long God, this is the next verse, let's get it up there. How long God will the enemy taunt? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? They're, they're trying to figure out, the psalmist and the people trying to figure out, how long will God, let God, will God let these people go on and taunt him? You know what taunt means? It means basically make fun of you. Make fun of you. Scoff at you. Nah, nah, nah. That kind of stuff. Your God's not anything. Your God can't do anything. Or he would, right? Our God's more powerful than yours. They heard this kind of stuff all the time. So they raise these questions. How long, God, will the enemy taunt? Is the enemy to revile? Revile, me, revile, revile means to despise or spurn. That's another word. You just ignore it. Your name who you are forever. So the taunting is towards God, by the way. Not just what they've done towards the people, but what they're doing towards God. That's the big thing here. His temple, also his words. So it's against God, his temple, his words, and his people. So instead of hearing from God so far, all they've heard is their enemies taunt God. And we see the people very concerned how they view God's name. And you know, when you're the most, the most faithful Christians around, you don't like to hear God's name used wrongly or people make fun of God. You feel that little pain in your heart when you hear it, this lack of respect from people. That's normal for a faithful Christian. You don't like to hear those bad words, those foul words. 
those blasphemous words towards your God. So they raise the question in verse 11. Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand, take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them? So now they're saying, God, why are you withholding discipline from these rotten people? You know, it's one thing for you to be bad with your nation, like the psalmist and, and the people had been as a whole. They were, they were bad. But now they see some people who are much more worse, who are cruel, who are mean, who are ruthless, who slaughter their people, who destroy the temple, much worse than Israel. And God's using them as the hammer on Israel. If you know what I mean? He's using that most evil nation to destroy a bad nation, Israel, because they're being bad. All right? Well, that's sometimes the way God works. He uses the worst people to destroy his own people who have been disobedient. They become the paddle, you might say, to be spanked by, seriously. So here's what they say. Why do you hold back your hand, your right hand? Now, your right hand is most of us. That's our stronger hand, right? So it's like the Lord is holding back, working for us. Take it from the fold of your garment. It's like God had a, a, a robe on and he had his hand inside the robe. Take it out under your robe and destroy them. That's what they're saying. Destroy the enemies. Verse 12. Yet God, my king, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Now they remind everybody, the psalmist reminds everybody, God is my king. From ancient times, he's worked salvation in the midst, among the earth. That's what midst means, in the middle, among of the earth. God has always worked salvation for his people. Throughout history, from ancient times, God has worked his salvation, his deliverance among his people. How many times have we seen that happen in the history of Israel? Even in the Psalms, they talk about it, okay? Like being delivered from Egypt from the very beginning. And then victory after victory uh, with, for example, battles of David. All those battles, all those victories for years and years. Verse 13, they go back to creation, talk about his creative power. You yourself divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. Now, this is interesting. You divided the sea by your might. We know that God did some sea dividing at the beginning at creation, right? We also know he divided the sea for the uh, Israelites to escape from the Egyptians. So they could refer to one or both of those. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. Now, what's this all about? Well, taken from the standpoint of people like the Babylonians or the ancient Canaanites, they didn't know what was out in the oceans, just like the Israelites did. They didn't know it was way out there. No one had traveled around the world yet, anything like that. They probably didn't even know it was round, right? So they thought what was out there was some sort of monster. And they knew, knew that if the people went far enough out in the sea, they didn't come back. So something must have got them. Maybe they just lost at sea. We don't know, do we? But the point is, they saw some sort of monster out there. And now what the psalmist is saying, uh, you got control over the seas. You divided it by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters. Whatever those ancients thought was out there, and I'm talk, not talking about the Israelites, but whatever those ancients thought in their mythologies, like the Canaanites or the Babylonians, God conquered that too. There's nothing to be afraid of. He's the creator God. So whatever the pagans claim about monsters in the sea, God conquered them too. They go on about this in verse 14. You yourself crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Now, let's talk about a couple of words here. We're talking about Leviathan, but first I want to talk about the creatures of the wilderness. Wilderness, as you know, is sometimes translated desert. 
um, in this case, could be, uh, since it's a sea monster, it could be along the uh, beaches of the desert. So the picture is that, this monster Leviathan. Now, what's the Leviathan? Well, that's a mythological creature. We find it in ancient literature, what they call Ugaritic. Now, Ugaritic is a language that goes back uh, before the time of even Hebrew, uh, or about the time of Hebrew, back when they uh, had people living in an area called, we call today, Syria, and the language was Ugarit. They used triangles, believe it or not, triangles for their language. They just pointed them in different directions. It's kind of weird. I studied some of this when I was in uh, graduate school. Anyway, these sea monsters sometimes have multiple heads. Notice, crush the heads. Do you notice that? Heads. So it has more than one head. So it's a mythological creature. It's like saying, look, we even crushed your monsters. God even crushed your monsters. I don't care how big and scary they were, were to you if they were Godzillas or some other monster. God destroyed that too. So that's what they're saying. God not only destroyed their monsters, he destroyed their gods. Uh, he can do that. He, can, he controls the seas. All right, so that's the idea. Uh, God destroyed their monsters. This is the psalmist addressing God. You yourself destroyed, or just crushed rather, the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. So like he busted them up out in the water and they just what, their body parts floated up and they ate them for dinner. That's what happens here. That's the way it's described. He goes on, talks about their God's continued control. You split open brooks and springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. You see, God can do anything when it comes to nature because he's in charge of nature. He made nature. He keeps it going. He keeps our air going so we can breathe. Our water flow from evaporation to condensation to clouds to, to rain falling to us getting water again, fresh water again. So that's all in God's plan. That's all his design. Verse 15, yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the heavenly light and the sun. So this way saying that God controls the day and night, right? You have established the heavenly light. That's probably the moon here since the sun is the other one, right? So like God, you made the sun, you made the moon, you make daylight, you make nighttime fall. You control all of that. Verse 17, you have set up all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Now, what are the boundaries? Well, it could be a couple of things. First of all, it could be the natural geographical boundaries like coastline, seacoast. Uh, continents are divided by oceans, aren't they? Uh, countries uh, divided by rivers and mountains. So it could be those boundaries, or it could be just the boundaries or the dividing lines between summer and winter. We have summer and winter, spring and fall. These could be what the boundaries are referring to also. This is another way of saying that God controls nature. As I'm doing this video, there's a big volcanic eruption in Iceland. And it's fascinating to watch on the, on the television screen. I don't think I'd want to be there, at least not very close. But that's God's control. He controls these things. He controls the weather. He controls volcanoes and earthquakes and all those things. Just as he set up the boundaries of the earth and made summer and winter. We come to our last section beginning in verse 18. Let's just read over that section heading again, reminds us of what's coming. Number four, the psalmist pleased to God to consider his covenant. So these adversaries will stop reviling him and oppressing his people so they can have reason to praise. It's kind of a long one, but it has some main points here. They're gonna ask him to, talk, to uh, consider the covenant. Think about the covenant you made with your people. So you can stop these adversaries that are hurting your people and oppressing them, and then give them good reason to praise. Give God's people good reason to praise. In other words, let's have some victory. Let's have some relief. All right, verse 18. 
They begin, remember this, Lord, the enemy taunts. All right, they already mentioned that. And a foolish people reviles your name. These fools, they reject God. They reject you. They reject your truth. And they're the really, really bad guys. Remember that. God uses those evil people to punish his people when they were bad. So the enemy continues to taunt. They insult. They ridicule. They call them a foolish people. And again, it's your name, who you are. And remember, to Israel, God's name was sacred. In fact, they weren't even supposed to pronounce what we say today as Yahweh. And today, some of them won't even do it. They'll substitute another word. The psalmist goes on to say, Do not give the life of your dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Now, the dove here would represent what's left of Israel, Judah. Don't give your innocent little dove, vulnerable, easily destroyed dove, to these wild beasts, these wild animals. That would be the Babylonians. Don't let them chew us up. Don't let us let them completely destroy us. He says, do not forget the life of your poor. The poor is those who've been, who are being oppressed, who are in prison, who are in captivity. God, don't forget us. Don't forget our lives. And then they go back to the covenant. Consider the covenant. Now, you remember the covenants. We'll talk about them in just a moment. Let's read through this. Consider the covenant. For the dark places of the land are full of violence. They are places of violence. Now, the covenant could go back to the Abrahamic covenant. That was when they were promised the land. Or the Mosaic covenant. That was on top of the Abrahamic covenant that brought the blessings when they were obedient. So they're saying, Lord, think about your covenant. The point being that the Lord needs to look at the covenant and see his obligations towards his people. He had promises to keep with them. He couldn't destroy them completely. But they had to be punished. And that's what had to happen. So they tell God, basically, don't forget your covenant. You can't destroy us. You're not supposed to destroy us. We're still your people. You have a deal with us on this. Yes, we were disobedient. But don't destroy us. They go on to say, look at the middle line. For the dark places of the land are full of violence. That means every place that's dark, it's violent. There's no place to be safe at night. They are places of violence. Sounds like a big city in the United States, doesn't it? Don't go in the dark places. You're liable to get robbed or worse. Verse 21 let not the oppressed turn back in shame. Let the poor and the needy praise your name. Well, the oppressed are those in captivity. Don't let us come back to the land in shame. Help us recover. Help us get right with you. Help us get in that place of blessing. So they want to change in their status. Let the poor and the needy, that's the afflicted, that's those in captivity, Praise your name. Let us get to where we can really praise you again for all the blessings you're pouring out on us. But right now we're getting hammered. So that again, they keep playing to God. And by the way, this went on for some 70 years because they didn't get any relief for almost 70 years and start to return back to the land. Now, did God get, did watch over them? And remember that God will always watch over you. But sometimes if you've been bad, he will discipline you. As a nation, he will discipline that nation. Now this is Israel. They're special, so they get special discipline. And that's what's happened. He will return them to the land. But first they've got to go through this discipline. Verse 22 they call to God to act. They say, Arise, God, defend your cause. Remember your taunts from the fool all the day. So again, they remind God of the taunts. They tell God to act. Get up, Lord. Get up, God. Defend your cause. We're your cause. We're your people. Defend your name. They destroyed your sanctuary. Get us back to where we need to be. And it's just hard to imagine 
after having the temple destroyed, how God would bring them back. But he would. And they did rebuild a temple, though it wasn't nearly as grand as the earlier one with Solomon. Defend your cause. That means to deal with them, argue about it, show them who's right. And there's the word taunts again. This actually is the noun this time. Earlier it was the verb. But the noun form of the verb taunt. So he's saying, remember your taunts. Remember what they're doing from those fools, from the fool, all day long. This is what they do all day long. And this taunting Lord does not have to continue. You're the one who can act right now if you'll get up and act and stop this ridicule of these fools. Verse 23, do not forget the voice of your adversaries. The uproar of those who rise against you, which goes up continually. Again, we see another complaint about what these Babylonians and the adversaries are doing. Whoever had teamed up with the Babylonians and taken over that part of the world. They've talked about their taunts time and time again. Their voices roaring. Uh, he, again, they say at the end here, this is the last verse, do not forget the voice of your adversaries, what they've been saying about you, about your people, about their victory over your temple, over the destruction they've done, their victory shouts. Second line again, the uproar of those who rise against you. It just keeps going on. It says, which goes on continually. They keep screaming and hollering about their victory. After all, they got all that gold and silver and bronze and furniture and sacred object, objects out of the temple. They might have kept some of the curtains and things like that that were really nice and finely embroidered. So the last verse here talks about them calling to God not to forget these loud, noisy, taunting, roaring, enemies that are against you, Lord, and against your people. And that is a good reason for you to rise up and act. And that's the way it ends. And if you know the story, in about 70 years, the people will be released and they'll start going back and rebuilding another temple. Let's read our psalm, Psalm 74, a mesquil of Asaph. God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage, and this Mount Zion where you have dwelt. Step toward the permanent ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your enemies roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their battle flags. They are like one swinging axes in the forest of trees. Verse 6, And now they tear down all its carved work with axe and hammers. They set on fire your sanctuary, burning it to the ground. They profane the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, let's completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there anyone among us who knows how long this lasts. How long, God, will the enemy taunt? Is the enemy to revile your name forever? Why do you hold back your right hand? Take it from the fold of your garment and destroy them. Yet God, my king, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You yourself divide the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. You yourself crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You split open springs and brooks. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also the night. You have established the heavenly light and the sun. You have set up all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. 
Verse 18, Remember this, Lord, the enemy taunts, and a foolish people reviles your name. Do not give the life of your dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your poor forever. Consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of violence. They are places of violence. Let not the oppressed turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, God, defend your cause. Remember your taunts from the fool all the day. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who rise against you, which go up, goes up continually. Let's pray. Oh, Father, again, we thank you for another psalm. This one a little different than what we've studied recently, but we thank you again that we can see how you work among your people, how you do punish your people, but at the same time, you have all the power and the strength and everything necessary to bring them back. So we ask that you will do that for us personally as well, as well as for our nation, for our church, for our group, as we repent and turn back towards you. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.